I'd like to thank you, Kay, for having the opportunity to present this webinar. So thank you all for that and every, all the attendees as well today. As they had mentioned, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. We'll be glad to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll be glad to get back with you and get you a response. So hopefully everyone's having a wonderful morning. Um, we're going to get on with the presentation. Uh, Janet pretty much touched base on pretty much everything about me. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I'm very, uh, very fortunate that, you know, that I've never had an injury related to a chainsaw, but the industry, we're gonna cover statistics and everything today. And why this topic's important is because I've had friends that have been seriously injured and hurt from chainsaw related injuries. And you all may have had the same in your workplace or, or at home. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty much, you know, straightforward. The whole idea is with chainsaws, injury prevention. So it's, as you work, with this type of equipment, you're going to have different things that you touch on. So when you relate to chainsaws, there's so many types out there anymore. I mean, you got different manufacturers, you got obviously steel, Husqvarna, Craftsman, Echo, and, and so forth. But then you have your standard type of saw that has a pistol grip. And then you also have your arborist type saw. Uh, some are fuel, some are electric. And then you have, obviously you have post saws that are out in our industry that we use, uh, residential and commercial. So using a chainsaw, there's multiple uses for them. A lot of arborists use them obviously every day, um, tree removal companies, uh, public works entities, government agencies, state as well, use these on a daily basis for whether the tree's standing or in the right of way they gotta clear it or it's down on the ground, they have to get a roadway clear. So, Take that in mind, and some folks actually quite often use them in bucket trucks. So, and you also have climbers as well. So the importance of the training is obviously, we said, injury prevention, but also workforce development. You wanna make sure your employees have the right tools and the knowledge and education to practice safe work practices. And obviously you have the OSHA requirement standpoint, which we're gonna go into next here. Go. Um, chainsaws. You have OSHA, obviously, you have the construction industry, which is 1926.20 uh, training requirements, and you also have the 1910, which is a general industry. Then you have the Arbor Standard, which falls under ANSI. OSHA is Occupational Safety Health Administration, and the ANSI is the American National Standard Institute. They're the ones that actually create the standard. OSHA is the safety police. They enforce it. Um, Training requirements as it pertains to any type of equipment. Um, OSHA can always reference any type of specific course or anything, but it's a good practice. When you coming into a workforce, you need to have your initial training, then you should have a refresher every three years on any equipment that you operate in your industry per your job classification. Um, if you've seen someone perform in an unsafe manner, involved in an accident or near miss, or if you get new type of equipment or workplace condition change, you need to make sure everyone's up to speed in regards to the standards as well as their equipment they'd be operating. <clears throat> uh, today, here's your course outline. And we're gonna be talking about statistics here in a second, um, as well as the liability cost that may put a burden on a company or government agency. Um, as we go through the webinar, once again, this is not everything that you actually need to be trained and qualified per an OSHA requirement. So, if you, like I said, if you need that course, we'll be glad to reach out and help you out. Um, personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is something that's very crucial when it comes to safety. You're supposed to have engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE, personal protective equipment, should be your last line uh, protection. But with chainsaws pretty much comes to the front line. Uh, the different components on chainsaws, I'm gonna have a diagram I'll show you and kind of tell you what's what on a, a piece of equipment. Chainsaw maintenance is crucial, uh, as well as cleaning your equipment. You gotta take care of your equipment to prolong the life of your equipment and then talk about general safety precautions as it pertains to the safe work practices and different techniques that you need to practice throughout, throughout your work practices on daily operations. Some statistics. Now keep in mind, not all statistics do get reported annually. Some there's stuff in the industry, some people don't report because we're in the fear of embarrassment. 
or whatever the case may be, or it's, it's a minor in incident that required just basic first aid. So if you look at statistics in 2012, there were 243 people that actually lost their lives engaged in tree trimming and clearing activities. So that they've categorized this as being struck by a falling tree or limb, caught by a wood chipper. Yes, that still does occur, unfortunately. Uh, falls from a tree, um, some type of lift uh, or a ladder, and electrocution. So just those are the main ones. There's other minor stuff, but just keep that in mind. And then as we roll into it here in a second, I want you to put in the chat box on your on why you think 80% of the injuries impact the legs and the left wrist. So if you could, if you could put in the chat box on why do you think that is? Someone says kickback. So you got kickback. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. But you put your, a lot of people, since there's no left-handed chainsaws, natural accidents, throw your left hand and wrist up, right? Also, the legs, a lot of people do not wear chainsaw chaps, unfortunately. And that's, that being said, your average chainsaw injury only requires 110 stitches. That's quite a, quite a few stitches. You know, so just wearing them chainsaw chaps because it's a it's a rotating chain that's going to depends on how sharp that chain is, is as well. So if it's sharp, it's cutting through that flesh, unfortunately. Most injuries occur due to the following. Um, people have actually used one hand because they get start getting tired or they get comfortable with the equipment. And a lot of people like to use the one hand when they're using the smaller compound saws like the Arbor style. There's a pistol grip on the back and a handle on there for a reason. Uh, over aggressively cutting. Um, you got people that when get in a hurry and want to get it done. So they start getting in a hurry and, and making it happen. And that's when injuries occur. Um, a lot of people have lack of knowledge and experience. This is primarily a lot of folks, homeowners that get a chainsaw for their first time. But there's also folks that come into the industry that we've seen that never operated a chainsaw before. And fatigue. The operating a chainsaw is a workout if you've never operated one, but most of you all probably already know that. Now, if you take a look here, this is a, a chart here from statistics from my actual 2010 from the um, Grand Forest uh, U.S. Consumer Product Commission or whatever. So when you're looking at it, it says almost 31,000 injuries were reported in 2010. Just take in mind that a lot of do not go reported. So you'll probably double that, in my personal opinion. Now, take notice of the areas that have been impacted. Look at the legs and the feet. That's if you had chainsaw chaps on them, a lot of that would be prevented, eliminated those type of injuries. And look at the right hand versus the left hand. If you're operating with your right hand, you got the left hand, it's going to kick back at you and you throw that hand up there. And you have some uh, shoulder and chest but also you have the facial portions of it. And I've actually seen a facial injury before on a job site that I was on and the young gentleman got pretty, pretty messed up from it. So looking at all that, and like I said, these injuries, the kickbacks and how sharp that chain is and wearing your proper PP and having it on properly is important. So who pays for injuries? Uh, if you, obviously, if you work for a government municipality, raw taxpayers, if there's an injury there. If you work for a, a private business, a small tree, a tree trimming business, there's risk management and liabilities associated with that. Uh, workers' comp, uh, people lose time and bills. Uh, if something's severe enough where OSHA has to come in and do an investigation, you may uh, get some penalties or fines assessed to your operation. And obviously, operational costs, you got loss of production because an employee's out. Now, the direct cost is pretty much that, but the indirect cost, a lot of people don't really take into consideration, is usually six to 10 times higher than the actual injury itself. Because you personally, the bottom three here, talk on, personally, you got stress, you got downtime, uh, people get embarrassed, uh, recovery bills. I mean, if it didn't happen at work, it happened at home. I mean, you hopefully have personal insurance that help uh, take care of you on that. And 
and this everyday tasks become hard if you have sustained some type of injury. If it happens at work or, or at home, workload will increase. Um, you have people that actually had to pick up your weight, carry your, carry your slack, and they may mandatory overtime, morale, stress on them. But the biggest one that's going to affect the most out of everybody is your family. I mean, if any of you all have ever taken care of someone before, being a caretaker is hands down the hardest job I've ever done. So just keep that in mind, your daily activities, uh, from mowing the grass, if you do that, any daily activities, your chores, your bills, Somebody's going to have to help take care of you and pick up the way, whether it's your spouse, your, whatever, your wife, your kids. Somebody's got to help you out, and it, it puts a burden on them as well. So practicing this chainsaw safety and wearing the uh, PPE and stuff that we're going to go into pretty much is huge. So make sure you wear it. Personal protective equipment. Obviously, any of this equipment you need to inspect and before use each day. Does PPE go bad? Yes, it does. It expires. It could be get damaged for numerous reasons. Uh, sun exposure breaks some of the stuff down. But we're going to start off with the head protection with the face shield. Obviously, you got to be ANSI approved, hard hat. It's going to be a Z89, preferably a Class E with the face shield. Um, when you're operating your equipment, you want to make sure you're using it to its full potential. If you've ever been chainsawing, a chainsaw helmet with the shield is ideal. Uh, some folks say it's optional, but I mean, I, my personal opinion, I think it's mandatory because I've been hit in the face with twigs a long time ago, and I understand the importance of wearing a, a hard hat with a face shield. Um, your safety glasses uh, or goggles got to be ANSI Z87 approved. Unfortunately, there's no Z87 police out there, so there's folks that buy cheaper brands, off brands of safety glasses at wherever the flea market or wherever, beware what you purchase. And you got to inspect it, make sure it's probably, they got clear tint, smoke, amber. They even have a really good uh, safety glasses now that actually have anti-fog that's actually baked into the lens. Because I know operating a chainsaw, all that body heat comes up, you're, it creates another hazard because it gets fogged up. Um, moving on to hearing protection, as you notice on the hard hat, you have um, the earmuffs, but there is an option being a chainsaw operator wearing a hard hat with earmuffs during the summer months gets you extremely hot. Um, so winter much is ideal, but they have so many versions of earplugs and earmuffs that are out there. Earplugs, you can wear them in conjunction with the earmuffs, but it's going to reduce this, the noise decimals by another five decimals. So I'm gonna show you a video here in a minute. It kind of shows you what to do. They got the Christmas tree kind that are reusable. You have the one-time use that are disposable, the, uh, the foam. Um, hand protection. Do not use jersey gloves with no grip. Obviously you want a firm grip, some type of glove that actually provides something that you can actually hold the chainsaw with because it's plastic, right? So a jersey glove, your hands and all that are actually gonna be slippery if you're not using it right. And then they also make gloves that are cut resistant. So I prefer a glove that's got some type of padding for anti-vibration. Leg protection. This is where you notice in that chart I showed you a few slides ago, a lot of the injuries occur to the legs. Um, a lot of homeowners sustain these because in the workforce it's enforced on a job, whereas when you're at home, people get lax and comfortable. They may have or may not even have access to a pair. So they get comfortable. There's a material in these called Intec. It's a, it's a cut retardant, essentially. Can you still sustain a cut on your leg? It can still cut through your jeans, through this. And uh, like I said, it depends on how sharp your chainsaw is and how many RPMs it's running at the time of impact. But you got to make sure you inspect these. If they have any nicks or damage in them, you need to get rid of them and get you a new pair. I know they, some pairs get expensive, but you got to make sure you have the proper length. Everybody's different heights, short guys, um, tall guys. Got to make sure they go over all the way down and cover the top part of your boot. And you got to make sure all your straps work. They even have a belt ex uh, extenders that go around your waist for, for some heavier set folks. Make sure you have those and they're properly on. Um, I did notice when we got a couple new pairs of our chainsaw chaps, there's a tag on them that says you need to wash before you put into service. 
I'm assuming that it helps the intact activate a little bit more. So when you're doing that, but I would not put them in a dryer or anything and put any type of heat towards those chaps. It could damage them. Um, foot protection, uh, steel or composite toe, something that's uh, it's got ankle support. And obviously a leather type boot's going to hold up if a chainsaw ever did hit it versus like a nylon or polyester type of boot. And then you got to have steel composite toe. So making sure it's all laced up properly. And then another big is clothing. What is a chain on a bar? You're running it. It's wide open. It's a rotating wrap point. So you want to make sure you have any loose fitting clothing, hair, anything that you may be wearing. It's not going to cause a snag point and pull the saw back in towards you. And additional PP may be required per your job function. So being in public works industry, our folks are required to wear a class three vest, but it's got to be zipped up or a uniform shirt that meets the standards of the MUTCD and the other regulatory organizations. We're going to watch a video. And as you notice here, this gentleman has a jacket on in the picture. <clears throat> well, a lot of our arborists actually purchased those. It's the same as the material as the, the chainsaw chaps. It's got the cut retardant in it to help prevent an injury because some of the impacts from the diagram you notice were up towards the chest area. So these folks that actually perform chainsaw operations daily would benefit from a jacket like that, but it's not required. Uh, play the video here for you. This one we'll stop it before the, the chat portion of it and I'll kind of narrate this for you. A hard hat with your obvious face shield with the earmuffs. Make sure it all properly functions. <clears throat> you got your safety glasses and multiple versions of these but make sure they are the Z87 approved and it's usually stamped right there on the side. You got hearing protection, multiple versions of this. That's the kind of kind of hangs around your neck. The blue and with the reds, a Christmas tree kind. These are reusable. Just make sure you wash them, keep them clean. Those are the one-time use phone ones that are disposable. Don't use the jersey gloves. Use something that's secure with padding. And like I said, you can get these that are cut retardant, cut resistant. Check your chaps out. Check all your <clears throat> buckets, uh, buckles, billets, and stuff. Some you can actually attach a jacket to this this pair, this pair here. We've had uh, folks wear these and not actually buckle them, and they said the buckle was broken. They were falling down on them, so we actually had to repair it, replace the buckle, or take them out of service. And it goes all the way down to the, all the way down to the back of your calves. Your boots, a set of leather type boots, something that's still composite toe, but a hard sole bottom, slip resistant. And this is what it looks like in full gear. Hard hat, earmuffs, shield. Whether you have a shield or not, you're still required to wear the safety glasses. Got the gloves. Chaps are up around the waist, they're secure around the leg and snug, and they cover all the way to the top part of the boot there. And you got your steel composite toe boots. Go back here. So having your proper PP and inspecting it and putting it on properly is key. Now, this is the video I'm going to show you here. This is the aftermath of what chainsaw chaps are intended to do. We see the fibers, obviously. That's this designed to clog up the side gear right there down in the chainsaw to bring it to immediate stop. Uh, you see I cut the pants. It didn't even go through the back side of it. Then it, it, one part of it, it hit the wood or whatever on the log that we strapped them around. But you'll notice in the video, this gentleman drops it down pretty hard, and it's a pretty heavy weight saw when it makes the actual impact. But the damage it would have done if it did not have chaps on. I'm going to let you watch the video here.
He drops it now pretty hard. Bring the chainsaw to a stop. You see I pulled the log a little bit. You notice the little nick in the wood there. Now, the part you got to deal with after that is the cleanup. To clean these out, uh, some people take a, a blowtorch to the front sprocket area to clean it out, but all that stuff that's in the gear housing, you may have to take that to a dealer. You actually have to take that apart to get all those fibers out of there and for if you whenever you reuse that saw again. So, uh, the components as it pertains to the chainsaw. Um, obviously here you got this is your standard chainsaw and this is like a low-end residential one you got the back area it's got the trigger on the back and you got the safety switch the trigger should not be able to move unless the safety switch on the back part is pushed down they call that area the pistol grip um, you go through there check it all out and then you go to the front you got your fuel tank and your fuel cap a lot of feedback I'm getting from folks is those type of caps that are on this, this image here are not really, they break pretty easy because cross threading and people torque them down too tight. They like the other standard caps where you use the tool. You got your housing, uh, then you got your front part of it, you got your oil reservoir and your uh, bar oil cap there. You go on up, you got your handle. You notice on a lot of the saws on that black front handle there, you'll notice that uh, there's a torsion bar, on, a torsion spring on the bottom, that's for anti-vibration. They have some type of, type of give for you. And they do not make a left-handed saw. I'm sorry if you're left-handed, it, it makes it more challenging to make operate one. So rolling on to the front, you have a bar. Uh, you can get an 18 inch bar, 20 inch bar. I've, we had a bar one time, I had a 36 inch bar on it. It was Big Bertha. So make sure all that chain obviously going through the front. On the front part of your bar here, there's a little circle. That area above that is considered your higher uh, risk of a kickback, you're known as your kickback area. And you're coming back, you have your muffler on the front, and then you got your uh, front hand guard. That's your actual essential, your chain break as well. So I'll talk to you and show y'all in a video here in a second how to check that properly. And then you got your um, starting pull handle, and then you got your back area, part of your other housing, your, motor with your air filter and all the other components inside of there. Other components that were not identified on there, obviously, you got a start stop button. It's a switch that goes up or down. Uh, chainsaws have the choke, half and full choke. And then uh, some of the options that you can purchase out there have a uh, primer with a fuel bowl on it to help get fuel to the car and, and then the decompression button. They some I got one of my uh, Husqvarna chainsaw as well. They call it the pop off button on me. So, but it makes pulling that cord a lot easier when you're starting it. So, having the, the chain and bar, can you put the wrong chain on a bar? Yes, you can. And when the best way to identify what type of size chain goes on that bar, it's stamped on the side of the bar itself. And sometimes they, it's kind of hard to read as you, if the bar gets worn, but make sure you have the proper length and the diameter for that with the proper pitch and everything for that chainsaw bar, because you can't put the wrong one on. Um, chain, can you put a chain on backwards? Yes. How effective you'll be cutting some logs with that? Probably not real uh, effective at all. Um, can you bend a bar? Yes. This is more prone when people get the bar wedged between it when they're doing some bucking or pinch between a tree and they're bending it back and forth. You're going to need to use a uh, probably a wedge or some type of axe to wedge in between it so you can release that pressure off the bar where you don't damage it because you can damage the bar, then you can also damage the, uh, the gear mechanism on the chainsaw. Um, if you would, down in the chat box, um, Dana, let me know what response you get. How have you ever used a chainsaw with a dull chain? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, I have. And that will work you so much more when you're operating if you didn't have a file system or some type of file to sharpen your chain. So give you a second to put in the uh, chat response box here and let me know what y'all come up with. But my answer is yes for me. You got a couple yeses and hopefully never again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for your honesty because I've been in that boat now and I don't, that's, I'm adamant about sharpening my chain now. 
and keeping a proper proper one ready to go with all the teeth on it. So, and, and when you're doing your sharpening or any type of adjusting of your chainsaw, you need to use a, a glove. Because obviously I've <clears throat> seen people actually cut their finger when they're just adjusting the chain, not even sharpening it without a glove. So they do get sharp. Chainsaw maintenance. Well, have anybody ever seen a damaged chainsaw? Yes. And it's pretty much from either somebody dropped it, it was struck by a tree, dropped on, was already laying in the, the work area, or in proper storage where people just throw them up in the back of a pickup truck and they're flipping around in the back of a truck and that's stored properly. So you make sure everything's good on your saw. From when I talked about all the different components, make sure it's up and running right for you. Um, checking your fluids. <laughs> this is a good one. Well, a lot of your chainsaws run at high RPMs, right? And when you read, if you ever read the manual on it, it tells you about using a higher octane, at least an 89 octane versus an 87, and use a full synthetic blend uh, to cycle mix versus a, a full synthetic blend. Use full synthetic because it's going to make the engine run at higher RPMs without bogging out on you. Um, so just making sure you use all that properly and mix it right because if you, you don't mix it right, you start building carbon deposits up on the pistons and it starts damaging the equipment itself. But anytime you're going to go refuel, you need to take time and let the, the engine cool down. You know, obviously it's running hot. It's a good time to take a break and stretch. Your fuel and oil caps, make sure they're on tight after you top off and wipe off any access on it. And do not use motor oil as a substitute for bar oil. Bar oil stick like honey. It's specifically formulated for that purpose. Engine oil is for a different purpose. I've seen quite a few people come and practice using some motor oil. So do not use, use that as a substitute. Cleaning your equipment. Uh, obviously, you chainsaw and you're going to have debris. You're going to have small dust particles. So I, right, easiest way to clean it is just take the side palette off. Use a small little, like, I use like a little brush that you detail your car out with to keep it cleaned out. Or you can use compressed air, but it's got to be less than 30 PSI but also make sure you have your PPE on when you're cleaning it as well, especially if you're using uh, an air chuck to clean it out. Uh, Two-in-one file. I'm gonna show you what I'm doing right here. I don't know if y'all can see it, but the most important thing about it is reading the labels that are stamped on it. You got making sure this one's a 3-8 pitch. It's gotta match the actual saw these here have three files in it. You'll have a flat, and then you'll have two rounds. And files can go bad, but then you got your arrows. There's some arrows here, and you'll notice a bigger arrow on this end. That's the direction you're gonna rope, run the file across this, uh, the chain here. To make sure you got the proper pitch and the groove or anything. If you use the wrong file for the wrong chain pitch, you will damage the chain. Um, my personal opinion, this is something a lot of uh, arborists I've talked with or are going to and a lot of industries are switching out because this is something you can have when you're on the go, when you're out in the field versus having a grinder. Not everybody's going to have a grinder with them, but I'm not personally not a big fan of the bench grinder because you can tear a chain up quickly if you don't know what you're doing and if it's not set properly. And you're not always going to have a child of some type of bench vice to secure it. But I'm gonna show, in the video, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a demonstration on it. So when, when it matches this up, like I said, the pitch is also on the bar. Match, make sure they match up and then follow the arrows as well as the angle. And then when I'm referring to the angle, you see the, the grooves here. They're this way and this way. And obviously you flip it over, it's going to go in the direction of the chain you want to. So. Hey, Jason, you're going to have to I could interrupt you. We have a question. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking, what's a good bar oil? A good bar oil? I would stick to the manufacturer's recommendations, like Husqvarna's got their version, still has theirs. Stick to the manufacturer's specs because it's formulated specifically for their style of equipment. So when you, you got a steel, go out to a steel dealer and purchase steel bar oil or Husqvarna or vice versa. Here's the video of sharpening with a two-in-one file set up. Obviously, it's a brand new chain on this chainsaw here. You got my PPE on. Here's your standard tool that you're going to get when you purchase a chainsaw. That takes the side paneling off, and that's how you adjust your chain. 
There's a side cover where dust particles build up and how you can adjust your chain. I go on and wear safety glasses in when I'm doing this because you can have a little piece of shrapnel metal come up. Obviously, make sure your files are in good shape. Now, they do go bad. The orange cap pops up on the end where you can actually buy replacement files for these. And these are about $30 a piece for one of these, but having a sharp chain, and like we said, operating a chainsaw with a dull chain is not a fun operation. <clears throat> Lining my angles up. And obviously, see how smooth that is? Because that's a new chain. Obviously, if you have a chain that's pretty beat up, curled in from heat, it's gonna it's gonna give you some resistance. So then you flip it over because obviously every other tooth goes a different direction. Make sure your chain breaks set doing this. You got a firm grip on the back pistol grip. I got a couple more questions about the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a method to make sure the chain isn't too tight or too loose? Yes, uh, follow the operator's manuals for each chainsaw. We're gonna basically you pull and you just like a half a tooth on the bottom. And obviously you should be able to move the chain free flow if it feels like it's grinding, it's a little bit too tight. But obviously the operator's manual on any chainsaw gives you direct guidance in regards to how to adjust it properly. On some saws it's in the front, some are on the side. And then you even have some saws now that you can actually adjust by a crank on the side, but I'm getting a lot of feedback from those. Those are breaking pretty relatively easy if you put too much force on them. And then the other question we have is, how often when you're doing a job should you sharpen your chain? I sharpen my chain probably, if I you start seeing stuff that's dust particles, obviously that's a telltale sign that you have a dull chain. Or at the end of the day, I definitely sharpen mine after I make a couple cuts. I take a look at it when I'm refueling it, and sometimes I'll go on and hit it because my personal opinion, every type of wood you can cut into, if you're hitting it into the dirt or whatever that's underneath the log that you're bucking on, that actually will dull it down really quick. So practice, it's, it's gonna vary based on the type of wood you're cutting as well. But at the end of the day, I go on and shut mine down, and then I, I let it all cool down and I clean it all up before I put it back in the case and make sure it's fully sharp for when I pull it out next time it's ready to go. That's just a work practice I've got into. So operating a chainsaw. <laughs> well, I think we all can agree you're going to get a workout, right? That's, if you're not used to it, a lot of bending over. Salt, some saws do get really heavy. Um, be in good physical shape. Be ready for the task at hand. I mean, stretch before, during. Uh, the next day, you will feel sore. You work muscles that you're not used to working. Uh, fatigue is one of the reasons people get hurt. Take breaks. You don't have to get it all done. Cut, 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 cut. Take breaks, stretch. If you see any tree removal company, you'll see them. They do take their breaks. They hand the saw to the next person, and they rotate in and out if you have that luxury. Using the right saw for the job. Uh, obviously, it's like you gotta have limits. Equipment has limitations. It's like pulling a boat with a, a four cylinder truck. It's gonna struggle. You need a V8. So if you're cutting some big logs, heavy duty stuff, you need to hire a bigger chainsaw with a bigger bar. Obviously, they make different styles for that. So don't be trying to use a, a compound arbor saw. I see a lot of that because it's easier to handle and they're lighter weight, but you're gonna have to push more pressure on it. They're designed for smaller limbs and logs. Um, bystanders, this is huge. Uh, if you can eliminate the hazard by getting the, everybody that does not need to be in that area, a lot of people that do get injured and chainsaw related aren't just the operators, or people that are bystanders, people that are watching. Set up a perimeter. Uh, we got in a practice, we use eight to 10 cones. We set up a perimeter and, and no one's allowed inside the, the felling area or the operational area in case something goes bad. Uh, you're Safety manual is a great source of information. I mean, there's a lot of information in there that pertains to the piece of equipment, the make, manufacturer, model that you'll be using. If you ever need to reference it, I keep mine with my case at all times. If I ever need it, I have a quick uh, access to information. And then your cell phones. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can find PDFs on, on your phone. I mean, a lot of people have all that anymore. So it's, you have access to information at your fingertips. 
job site assessments. Well, we implemented quite a few years ago job briefings before you leave the yard. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's got their PPE, cones, whatnot. But when you get to the job site, you need to do one there. I think we all can agree that there's no two trees alike out there, whether they're standing on the, or on the ground. So you need, you need to take a look at all that, do assessment, and frequently jobs change throughout the day. I mean, clean, stop and take a break and clean up your area for a little bit because you look around at some sites, there's tools, chainsaws, ropes, all the equipment, bystanders, keep all that clear. Um, especially when you're felling a tree, you need to have a planned escape route. I mean, they recommend a 45, but I always go at least a 90 if you can make that happen and make sure everybody's aware of what's going on at all times. Uh, environmental hazards. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got stories of in training. One time a snake come out of a tree. Uh, I've had stories of raccoons jumping out, hitting the bucket truck operator in the head and running down the, uh, the boom. But the most prominent one that most people get when you're out there in the woods is poisonous plants, contact and dermatitis. And if you've ever had poison ivy, poison sumac, whether it's dead or alive, you still can contract it. And that is no fun to have. So be aware of all that and stuff. If you can kind of clear that area out a little bit, make sure you have long sleeves on or something. It's something to protect you and wash your clothes frequently, especially if you're at the woods. Power lines. 10 foot of power lines, 25 foot of high voltage. Stay away from power lines. In, in order to work around and trim trees within that 10 foot radius, you have to be considered a, what they call a, a certified line clearance arborist. And most of your utility companies have folks that are specialized in doing that type of work. If you're not one of those, you're not allowed to uh, perform chainsaw operations in that. Uh, they have specialty folks that come out and do that and they know how to handle the situations and have the proper equipment and they have the proper training to do that. So if it's if within the 10 foot, leave it up to the professionals. More likely they're not going to train you. They're going to send more of their crews out to take care of the job for it and just be done with it. Maintain your footing while operating. Obviously, you got to make sure you're on a solid level ground. If you can't a lot of, you get out in the woods, it's ruddy. Try to maintain you've got good footing so you know how to position yourself and keep your foot away from the chain as you start cutting through the log. A lot of people are guilty of this. Never operate while standing on a ladder. I've seen it. I've seen neighbors do it and have to tell them, like, no, can't do that. And, and the reason why, but there's, there's been people that are on ladders that are actually falling and lost their lives and in serious injuries from falling because your natural reaction when you're falling is to grab something. And what's usually you're grabbing? You're grabbing the throttle. And it depends on all how you fall. So that's a no no. Drop starting is not permitted. Okay. However, you can drop start a saw if you're up in a bucket truck. You got to lean over a little bit with the saw hanging off the side and start it. Don't be starting it up here by your face. You can drop it, but when you're on the ground operations, drop starting is not permitted. You can cross your leg and position it or put it down on the ground, but you got to have full control of that saw when you're starting it. Um, near misses. That we've seen quite a few of those of these throughout my time where people walk up on a chainsaw operator while they're performing their chainsaw operations. But you gotta take in mind what's that chainsaw operator have? They have hearing protection on, they get the saw wide open, they're focused on their cut. So when you're focusing on your cut, how how much are you paying attention to everything else? Not so much, right? So when you're focusing, Try to get their attention from a distance. Wave at them. Try to get their – throw a little rock or pebble at them. Try to get their attention. But m make sure you just don't walk up on people. Tip of the uh, chainsaw, it does – that I told you, the front little circle area and up, that's more prone to kickback, uh, especially if you hit rocks, if you chain link fence. Um, or I saw a young gentleman had a chain link fence with a uh, chainsaw. He was using a compound saw. And he got too close and hit the chain link fence and it kicked back and it caught him right above the eye. Yes, he had safety glasses on, but it still got him really good up here on a chunk of his eye. Um, it was, I was right done uh, doing some tree work with him and he should not probably been using the saw. He probably should have been using some type of pruners, a loppers or something where he didn't have to, but he was bypassing and just wanted to keep using the saw because he thought it was quicker and easier. But unfortunately, he paid the price on that one. Um, as you see on the pictures down here, on the bottom two here, you got one on the left. It's kind of like a shading, kind of like a jerry curl format. No, that's what you want when you're cutting. That's a sign of a good saw that's sharp. To the right, obviously, it looks like sawdust, right? That means you got a 
pretty dull chain. It's not cutting right. And there are some woods that will still kind of dust on you a little bit. But anytime you hit the saw down in the ground, I mean, especially if it's more prone when people are getting, when they're doing their bucking or getting to the bottom side of the logs are cutting, they're still pushing that pressure and it goes through. Well, that saw goes right into the ground, into the dirt, any type of sand or thing. It's like sandpaper to these teeth on these chainsaws. And it will, then that's, you're going to be more likely having your file out and you're going to be sharpening your chainsaw because you do not want to operate for a bad saw. I'm going to show you all a video, uh, last part of this video here, and kind of talk about the uh, bar and the chain uh, carrying to the rear with the muffler. This is what ANSI requires, the brain, uh, brain, how to set the chain break technique by rolling the wrist. The handle does not rotate. You're going to use the back side of your hand here to set the chain break. And then having a firm grip, obviously, two, two hands and a thumb always, because you got to be ready because kickbacks do cause a lot of the injuries. Uh, as you notice in this picture right here, I want to show you, look at his foot placement. You see how his feet are far apart? Remember a lot of those injuries to the feet were because people like standing close, we have good footing and good balance. So I'm going to show you this part of it. This is how you carry it. So you see how you got to watch the tail swing when you turn, though, because a lot of chainsaw operators don't have that cover still on there. When you're carrying it, you got to carry that, the muffler, the bar to the rear. Just set the chain brake here. I release it. I'm going to use the back side of my forearm to set it. Roll the wrist. And to properly set this, you got to run your chainsaw wide open, full throttle. While it's doing that, you rotate it, and your chain should come to a complete stop. So when you have a chainsaw that's smoking, it's running hot, right? So when it starts smoking and doing all that, there's a couple things that's going on there. You either have a dull chain, you can have no bar oil that's feeding down the track of the bar. And that's usually, you can take the side off and you may have a full cap, full tank in your reservoir bar oil, but on the other side of that, you got the cover. There's little uh, oil feeders like orifices that actually feed the bar oil that grabs the chain. If you have a lot of dust particles that have built up in there, it will block those up. So it could be simple as that. But at that time, going to let it cool down and going to check it all out, do a full inspection, check your chain out. You want to sharpen it, go for it. Um, keep and trying to keep every time I, I got into practice, every time I top my fuel off, I go on and top my bar oil off. So it's just trying to get it's by keeping your practices and how you're going to do it. So keeping it clean and sharp is important. Some proper cutting techniques. Do not cut the log limbs like a steak. Guilty, 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 guilty. That is a workout for itself. I mean, just let the saw do the work. On, on one of the pictures I didn't show you is the, there's some spikes on the by the bar. Kind of get close to it and kind of do the teeter-tottering mechanism as you're going through it. If you're doing some limbing, do the undercut, then the overcut. Um, do not extend or uh, overextend or cut above shoulder height. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of people that are actually doing tree trimming the saws over their head and it's pushed the saw back into their face area. You're going to have an impact. So you don't want to do that. Do not stand on a downhill side of a log. Well, a lot of people get out there and they get complacent and what's going on. Uh, I had a story, a gentleman, one of the classes I've done recently, he was cutting a log and it was probably two foot in diameter. He had jumped off and rode and rode back on his leg and pinned his leg on the ground. He didn't sustain serious injury, but the saw didn't catch him or anything, but he had, had to have, have assistance to get that log off him. Had he been standing on the uphill side of it, it would never happen that way. So do a site assessment, job assessment continuously. It's very important. Um, always setting your chain break. You got to get into practice every time you're not running the chainsaw, whether it's in your hand on the ground or sitting down on the ground. Engage your chain break. It's just rotating that wrist forward. I mean, is this a common practice you got to embed into your operation? Um, storing equipment properly. And like I said, you got to keep out of reach of children. Um, you want to keep it stored, put up. Store it, don't throw it in the back of bed of your pickup truck. When you get back to the office, store it properly. And keep it all safe and keep everybody safe. Um, in the comment section, I want everybody to take a pledge, if you don't mind, that 
The pledge is, I pledge to perform chainsaw operations safely with all the required PPE and equipment. So if you take that pledge, hold yourself accountable, hold your coworkers accountable, um, your workforce, because I mean, the whole idea of running the chainsaws, you know, injury prevention. That concludes the chainsaw training portion of my webinar.